let's see now. Flywheel, shyster, and flywheel. I'm both flywheels, and shyster doesn't belong to the firm. Then what's his name on there for? Well, shyster ran away with my wife, and I put his name on the door as a token of my gratitude. <laughs> It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast, and this is episode 59, Flywheel Rides Again. I'm Matthew Conium, and the next voice you'll hear coming your way from New York faster than a speeding bullock is Noah Dyer. Hi, Matthew. I'm happy to be here. I do have to correct you, though. I'm actually not faster than a speeding bullock. We tested that this weekend. <laughs> it's close. I was in it right to the end, but the speeding bullock right, ran Right, it was a photo finish. Well, today we're going to be exploring one of the most fascinating chapters of the Marx Brothers radio history, what one might call the post-prehistory of Flywheel, Shyster and Flywheel. Today, this Chico Groucho radio series is very much a known commodity, with substantial chunks available online and the promise of a whole slew of beautifully restored episodes coming soon from our pal John Tefteller. But listeners of a certain age will know that that was comparatively recently Very much not the case. At first, we'd never heard of the show. Then suddenly, there were these scripts. But all the recordings were presumed lost. That's when, over in England, a bunch of guys had a very good idea. This is the story of the BBC recreation of Flywheel, Shyster and Flywheel. And joining us is the man behind that glorious adventure, writer Mark Brissenden. Hello, Mark. Hi there. Good to, to be on the podcast, listen to, uh, as you know, most, most of them, I think. I'm, a, I'm maybe a few behind. I haven't, I haven't built up the courage to do skidoo just yet, you know. I'm waiting. <laughs> I wonder you if know, we but, have any uh, listeners left after yeah. the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, wait, yeah. you're waiting for the right time, I, I can assure yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'm come. waiting till I've lost my, most, the rest of my hearing, you know, and then, I, then, I'm, <laughs> then I'm there. <laughs> Um, well, Mark, we always begin by asking our guests their Mark's origin story, and I presume it's fair to say that you didn't go into the Flywheel Project as a, a neophyte or, or a dilettante. Um, I imagine you're a fan of long standing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, you know, since childhood, literally. I mean, my but the story is now is I was about six, five or six or something. I have to say that I was born in the in the pre-internet years, as the end in '59. And this would be the mid, uh, sort of mid sixties when they would start showing the movies on TV and BBC. And my dad, it was a big piano fan, like jazz piano, and he loved Chico's piano playing, but he didn't like the Marx Brothers. So if their movie would come on, he would put me in front of the TV and tell him, to call him when Chico, the Chico piano bit came on. That's the only bit he liked. <laughs> <laughs> and then also because they were no, they were the Marx Brothers, and my name is Mark. You know, as a five-year-old, you think, oh, my brothers are on television today, you know, because, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's imagine then, and I can, I mean, I can't picture, but this is, this is why I always sort of feel that kind of monkey business might have been the first one I saw because, because I love that Maurice Chevalier routine. I mean, why wouldn't you be absolutely delighted by the Marx Brothers when you're like five or six with all the kind of business and the Harpo and the chick and the silly hats and painted on moustaches and they say things that, and everybody's outraged at their antics. And I remember that. I can remember, you know, from an early time in school and primary school, you know, saying, no, but I do a very good impression of Maurice Chevalier. You know, who knows <laughs> would know who Maurice Chevalier was. But, you know, it was just a funny thing to say, you know. So, yeah, so that that's really it. And then, you know, throughout growing up in the UK, in this, you know, the Marx Brothers on TV almost became a kind of a regular thing at Easter sometimes at Christmas. You know, you go to the Radio Times and then there would be a whole slew of their movies on, usually five or six of them, never never the whole lot. I, you know, and, uh, and it was usually Animal Crackers, Racist Opera, Monkey Business. One time, you know, Casablanca and in big store as well and stuff. But, you know, the Coconuts was well, one we di- I didn't see until I was an adult. And they, Same time as me, then, yeah, Channel 4, yeah. Fortunately, for some reason, they quite rarely showed Room Service and Love Happy. I don't know if somebody at the, <laughs> at the BBC... <laughs> but uh, but we did see um, Room Service, and a friend of mine one time, because uh, actually recorded, got his little cassette recorder and put the microphone right up to the screen and recorded the, the soundtrack of 
route service. And that's quite funny driving around in the car, listening to the turkey <laughs> gobbling around and all over there. But, uh, you know, so it is, as you know, I know it's a very, very contentious, this one, but it's probably a better movie to listen to than to watch. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Love Happy, I, th- I think I'm right in saying, was the first Marx Brothers film that was shown on British television. So Was it? Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It just it, it got better from there. But five, right. uh, five or six, you said you you you, you started. Yeah. That's comparatively young. We find that the average is more like ten, eleven, twelve. So I mean, presumably a lot of it went over your head. Uh, it's like, I I recall that because at this sort of period, I my my dad's mum was very much into the movies and that, that and and I sort of grew up with with this. That, that those stuff on, on the TV and asking her be, be babysitting and maybe watching like Captain Blood or something. And my grandma who worked in the West End all the time in the rag trade mostly and did a lot of work also near the um, Palladium. And she used to get tickets for all the shows and stuff like that. And and sometimes and it was a theatrical costume use that she worked in. And so sometimes, like, so she knew a lot about movies. And so I would sit there. And she would think she would look at it. Oh, I roughly know he was ever so good, power, you know. And but she would know all the stories, and we'd be watching <laughs> Kenneth Moore on the Thirty Nine Steps and stuff like that. And she'd just have little anecdotes. So I don't know. I mean, this is why I, I do it because when I originally got the book of Fly Little scripts, it's, I mean, I've really sort of been a sort of amateur sort of historian. It really is my sort of favorite period, and then very quickly became my favorite period of sort of history that era between nineteen eighteen and the kind of just the mid the mid thirties, where the end of the First World War, and then you basically got the birth of everything: jazz music, the development of silent films, and then sound comes in and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see, think. But yeah, obviously, at six years old, I probably didn't know the, you know what what Anaconda, Blue Steel was, and you know the the, the brilliant parodies of Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably going over my head a little, yeah. But yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, it's so, interesting uh, actually that that um, strange interlude bit. It does it does make people laugh regardless. Yeah. of whether or not they know what it is. It is just it is intrinsically funny, isn't it? That he keeps well, doing. Well, the lines that. are great. I was thinking, you know, how happy yeah. I could be with either of you if you both just go away. I mean, it's just a mm. it's just a silly funny line, you know. So that yeah. <laughs> so so before we arrive at Flywheel, uh, how, how did you get into writing comedy for a living? Well. Yeah, it was quite sort of early because, as I said, my I was sort of grew up. I think the parents were really into it, but they had a little kind of a movie camera thing that we would show things on. And so I I saw Laurel and Hardy. You know, Laurel and Hardy were on British television uh, at that point, and the Shorts and Chaplin and Keaton, and Harold Lloyd. I saw all of these people, you know, comparatively young. And because it's all silence stuff, that's funny. It's just slapstick. It, it's just very funny, you know. And it's um, and I had. Uh, 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 and and access to it that my mother didn't, and, and also as you said, the uh, Bob Monkhouse. I think that was later in the sixties, maybe early in the seventies. Bob Monkhouse used to do a show on a Saturday mornings on the television, which he would just, you know, just show clips of joined up bits of old silent comedy and stuff, stuff like that. So there was an access there, and I always loved it. And then also when in sort of it was about twelve, thirteen, I think you know they started to repeat the Goon Show on BBC Radio, which with obviously. Milligan and 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 a lot of the other Hancock shows and uh, so I had a lot of access uh, to that and and I always enjoyed it more. Comedy was was the thing I liked to watch and then you know I, I would not shine academically at, as it were and I left school quite young and enough to have sort of variety of jobs and kept losing them. I decided that I'd have a, you know I was really sort of at a loose end and I decided I used to listen to these comedy shows on radio and I was living back in London now and there was fringe theatre was around I thought I'd have a crack at writing some some comedy stuff some, some these sketches and jokes and routines that I, I liked and then I got into a, a show called News Review which was a fringe theatre thing a topical comedy show they they liked some of the things that I wrote and and also because they were quite sort of pun laden in a way, I always imagined that almost everybody I wrote, was, you know, the, the 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 main protagonist in any sketch would always somehow sound a bit like Groucho Marx because their voice was always in my head. And then um, that kind of led to doing those types of shows on BBC Radio. The shows called Weekending was in that, and then this would be in the mid 
eighties and uh, things like the news headlines. And there was, you literally, if you knew about it, you literally sort of turned up to a script meeting there in the BBC Light Entertainment Department radio. And then, you know, went to a meeting and, and so I just started to submit gags and sketches to this. And I, was, you know, I got a commission on one or two of these shows and, and I was sort of I was, working on I was going to say, you're, you're, making this, you're making this sound very easy. <laughs> I grew up with about with about 25 people who, who, who spent their weeks sending stuff into weekend English back <laughs> and uh, never getting anywhere. So uh, I think it helps. It's one of those things. I think it helps all sort of being there because, yeah, there was reams and reams of material sent in. And these shows were, yeah, yeah, the uh, uh, the lines. But, yeah, I can add on to this because, I mean, I remember the first gag I got onto, uh, onto the news headlines and I actually literally pitched the gag to the producer of the show. We went in and it was like that. There. But it helped being in London, you see, I was there and I was working in, this, this was a, the, sort of the alternative cabaret scene was happening. So I was helping to run uh, a cabaret in Shepps Bush where a lot of people, I don't know if your names like Nick Revel and Andy Hamilton uh, would come down there. People who are now very big writers and they were writing for Weekending and the commission show. And they would say, yeah, well, there's this meeting on Wednesday lunchtime and uh, for non-commissioned writers. You you literally just turn up. You go and, go and there's a, hi, I'm here for the non-commissioned meeting for Weekending and they give you a freelance pass and me about six months to get one joke off. So I was, I was persistent, I'll say that. <laughs> So let's go back to the origins of uh, Flyvale then. So you, you're now a, a seasoned uh, scriptwriter with your with your 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 feet under the BBC table. Um, tell me um, how the project evolved. I mean, beginning with the, the the sudden appearance of this of this book. Well, it was simple as that because because they revived Punch Magazine for a while, or they tried to revive Punch Magazine for a while, and it and it and it was in that era. It had the very bad sort of reputation of you'd only read it if you were in the dentist waiting room or something and there was nothing absolute which is always a bit harsh uh, be that day i went to the nearest bookshop which happened to be the penguin bookshop that used to be in liberties bought a copy of the book but they tried to revive it for a while and i was interested in it, and i wrote a couple of things uh, for it and so i was was buying it so as a research thing and i bought this copy and one day i bought a copy it was february 89 i think and it was um and Dick Vosborough was reviewing this book called Flywheel Show Us to Run Flywheel and the Lost Radio Show of the Marx Brothers and his scripts. And you think to yourself, I've never heard of this. What's this? <laughs> well, I had most of the books about the Marx Brothers. And I was just, you know, it was one of those things where I was just completely amazed because at that point I still had read and I didn't really, I mean, sitting here there today with all these new research and books that have come out, I thought, you know, that, and so. I went home and read them. I read the interview with Nat Perrin and the article about them and how they were found. And then, like I mentioned to you before, I thought to myself, how, how is this possible that this could just be forgotten? And um, So I flipped back through Joe Adamson's book, which is one of the ones I had. And think that, you know, there are a few little references in there to it, but, in, but they never leapt out. And I thought this, yeah, okay, and then I read them. And, of course, the scripts are hilarious. I mean... Towards the end, they obviously, you know, they were they bowdlerized bits of animal crackers and borrowed from monkey business and things to, to you know, after the, towards the end of the series. But the other thing I noticed immediately is that there were routines from Duck Soup in there which hadn't been made yet. So it, it, it was like, you know, so they obviously took stuff from the later movies from, from these scripts, you know, that largely written by Perrin and Sheikman. And I was amazed. And I, and I did ponder this part. Now, and then kind of immediately, but because I was then kind of, I, I sort of got not a promotion, but another kind of bump up because they used to have this thing called the BBC contract writer. And it was a, you got, there were two or three people a year who were given a, a contract. You were given a certain guaranteed amount of money per week just to write comedy and come up with ideas. And, but it also meant that, um, you know, they were, they were, you know, they obviously saw no other words. And I, and at the same time as I applied for and got this, wanted some content out, if you will, and wanted something back for the money. One of the things I thought I said that I would like to do if I was given this contracting was this Flywheel Shyster and Flywheel, which I had uh, shown to Dirk. And uh, so it was this kind of thing where um, you submitted it to a thing called the Program Direction Group, 
that you've put all these ideas into. And they looked at this thing and they thought, it was well, is this a good idea? Shall we do this? Do we think the writer that's submitted this can do it? Will they deliver? Can we, you know, you know, if we if we commission them, <laughs> will they run away with the money and we'll never see them again? But was it a difficult pitch? I mean, I can just I can just picture somebody saying, "Hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we do this fifty year old <laughs> load of comedy scripts?" I mean, did, did you get that kind of feedback? Or? My first fear, my initial, is that how do I pitch adapting radio scripts for radio? You know, that kind of feels a bit sort of like, um, yeah, but not really because. The books came out, and it was obviously the Marx Brothers was still on it. And there were two guys on the, you know, a guy called Harry Thompson and Jonathan James Moore. Harry Thompson was a producer at the cor- at the time, and Jonathan James Moore was the script editor for Radio Four, I believe. It was, and Martin Fisher was the controller of the. Martin Fisher was a little wasn't sure that there was a, a, enough initiative to recreate it, but it was a guy Harry Thompson who I knew and Jonathan James Moore were keen on it, and they thought they they were keen enough. Now, what this sort of group were, they were they were made up of producers on the corridor and everybody, you know, there there was a vote. And so the vote was a little uncertain, but that's why we had a pilot before we did a series. I said, okay, let, let, let's do a pilot show and see how it works. And then we'll we'll go from there. And how vital was, was finding the right cast? I mean, was, obviously uh, that would have been a deal breaker if, if, if you couldn't find a, a suitable pair of uh, voices. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, uh, the first thing there, first and foremost, was that it, it's not worth doing unless we can get a good groucher and chicken. That was the thing. Because I've seen, you know, I'm sure we've all seen things where you think, oh, my God. So, it, um, <laughs> so and then the one person I knew to ask would be Dick Vosborough because of the Hollywood Ukraine show that he did. And Dick Vosborough recommended uh, Mike Roberts and Frank, and Frank, of course, was the the musical composer of uh, Hollywood Ukraine, so he was obviously in it as Chico. And Mike had played Groucho in an Edinburgh Fringe version of is it not not on Broadway the, the original, but he'd been in a re, in a revival. And uh, Dick was uh, thought he was great. I mean, it, it is fair to say that they are a, a sensationally good uh, Groucho and Chico. I mean, a, a lot of people yeah. can do them just about well enough. Yeah. But they're really, really good. So, I mean, you, you must have been very, very pleased when you when you first heard them. They're amazing. I mean, you know, I mean, you didn't have to, you knew, you know, instantly. Either on, uh, over the years, I think Mike's Groucho was fabulous because it's, it, as you said, you, you, you hit on it. They, um, it's, it's, it's a nice sort of relaxed kind of, it doesn't rush at Groucho the way that some people sort of rush. I mean, to be fair, in the backs of our minds, you know, Barry Cryer was mentioned. He loved Groucho, and it did it used to do it, but but he did a nice enough sort of Groucho. But it, it's not one that you know sustains through a show. He, he, the people would there yeah. were a couple of other actors around that we could sort of thought we might give it a go to, but we wanted someone who could really act Groucho rather than somebody who could just do set up like da 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 da. Groucho makes a wise cracking reply, you know. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they. I mean, this is why Mike is a great voice artist and a very, very good actor as well. So you know, it's one of those things where you could sort, sort of, uh, Groucho is not there. He, he brought an actor's, you know, the sensibility to to uh, Groucho. Yeah. Whenever we used to do the recordings, they were they were great. They would just come on in costume and they would just Groucho and Chico, and the audience accepted them completely as Groucho and Chico, and and off we went. Yeah. One of the things I love about Michael Roberts as Groucho is uh, you can re- you can hear him thinking as Groucho, um, and I think in the top echelon of people who have played the role over the years, I, I think uh, as much as anyone, you can really hear the Groucho thought process going while he does the lines. There's never a sense that he's reciting them. Um, you can hear his mind work, and that's what makes Groucho himself so extraordinary. And similarly with Frank Lazarus, I think um, a lot of people, when they do Chico, you can tell that they're that, that they are obsessed with getting the accent right, and that that's their focus. And and it's you know the, there's a slightly contrived element because of that. Whereas with Frank Lazarus, it just kind of rolls so naturally. Beautiful, yeah. It's much harder to do Chico, I think, than Groucho, and uh, and yeah, Lazarus is, is as good as anyone has ever done it. 
Yeah, I think you would agree. But um, but yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, there there are the you know their their timing was you know having having seen them do flywheel as well. You know, just doing it, their their timing was great. You know, they they were rela- You know, they would do a line and they thought with flight and they would wait and then they would you know play it to the audience. That, you know, and this is what I mean. And they yeah, their movements. You know, it is. I think it was Frank Ferranti who said something about you know getting the shape of Groucho right or something and you know moving and in, inhabiting him in a way and then when you sort of get this sort of shape of him you know you you then sort of get the voice more but but yeah i mean but I, I think as you said like myself both mike and frank you know had been fans you know since childhood of them you know they absolutely adored you know, mike loved uh groucho and if that and so you know did they always perform in costume right right through the run yeah Absolutely, yeah. I yeah, mean, we did, they yeah. wouldn't do the rehearsals, but yeah, no, they would go off before. I mean, you know, I think they wanted. I mean, Frank had his own tailored suit made, per, you know, uh, perfectly for him. You know, in that, that, I mean, he had the whole number, you know, and then Mike would come out and uh, on his own grease paint moustache. They looked great, and you know, and and, uh, and as a result, but uh, I have to remind it, you were saying a little earlier about the um, going also getting the Marx Brothers. So it was a tiny bit back to the origin story in a bit, but a little later, is that a friend of mine had a very very cool um, sister who was an older sister who was working living out in Canada. They sent him all those um, Marx Brothers records that came out. You know the uh, the, the Groucho concert from Carnegie Hall and a lot of the stuff for the radio shows. Yeah, on. we just used to play them and listen to the kind of, you know, Groucho with Oscar Levant and Groucho with, you know, Lucille Ball. I wanted to ask you then about the um, adaptation process, because needless to say, it, it, it was anything but simply a case of taking those scripts as as they are and and, re- and redoing them. Yeah, and it's as simple as that, because once, um, it, it's a fine thing here, because when I sort of looked at this, I realized that, yeah, you know, going to be an adaptation I'm obviously wanted to use as much of the material, the original material as possible. I actually went and bought, this is the, the 1989, so this was sort of the dawn of this sort of computer age of the revolution. So I went and bought um, a PCW9512 word processor that I could use because I thought, I'm just going to be doing some, a lot of typing here today. And I've not, um, I've, at that point, I've just been using manual typewriters. So I'm right? not a natural uh, typist. I have no uh, sacred Jerry who had mental uh, skills. So, and uh, I couldn't actually learn to work it properly in time. So I ended up having to write the pilot on the manual typewriter anyway. So, yeah. because what we did was we had a, re- we decided to, I would type out one of the back one the scripts, if you like, and then we'd have a reading in the script room at the BBC Light Hand Department to see how they got And the cast came in and read this the script through. And it was about like 17 minutes long, 16, 17 minutes, you know, taking out all the commercials and, yeah. the, in, and, the, and the introduction things, you know, about like the ESSO room and stuff like that, the Five Star Theatre Presents. And all these announcements, they were, they were one of them, good night, ladies thing at the end, but you couldn't use any of those. So we had to take all that. And there's about, you left with about 17 minutes of actual scripted material. Right? You know, a modern BBC Radio 4 half hour is, you know, with hours. A song and intro which is about 24 25 minutes of actual scripting material so that was just too you know you couldn't sort of squeeze it up into a 15 minute thing because they, they didn't actually have slots at that at that time so you know the only way really to do it was was to kind of and um, try and take one of it or look, look for bits and so make a a, a 24 25 minute you know, with a song and then we just sort of decided on the songs because grown up with the with the Marx Brothers movies and stuff like that. And of course there were always songs in them and, and most of the other old time radio shows I'd heard at the time, of course, you know, Bob Hope maybe variety shows, you know, had songs in the middle. So I thought you could get, you know, um song in the middle there and and then effectively it becomes like a, two sketches before the song, two sketches afterwards and a postscript and that's makes about a 27, 28 minute show with announced with a BBC announcement. And so, you know, at the first thing that I thought to myself, now that doesn't work, that's going to be, you know, a bit more work than I saw 
would be the idea was you know it'd be great if because as you said well you the one little mention of john f there is that the thing the reason to do this is because no at this point no known uh recordings of these shows existed the the these scripts had been found by a miracle people like sort of Dick Vosbury, who I knew at the time, and then I got to meet other Marx scholars, if you like, and aficionados, you know, like if if he didn't know about it, then nobody put <laughs> nothing but it. And so it is quite funny because it, if another one episode sort of emerged whilst, you know, a, a, a while after we'd done it, we had no idea that, that, that John was someone like that about that and had some originals even, even by then, and there's now collected together about 11 i believe so you know the real reason was well there's no known recordings of these so let's put them you know, to, to give us ourselves an idea of what they would have sounded like and to me it was just a great opportunity to sort of like you know like a fancy like never doing i'll say she is it was just this opportunity to work with the marx brothers you know and this sort of just to get you know like that second hand smoke thing you know, you can sort of sit there with your script in that script room and imagine that, you know, this is like New York, 1932, and you're working with the Hawks Brothers. So, but that was it. So then I just sort of, you know, I mean, obviously I read the scripts and I actually took the copy of the book into the BBC and I photocopied the entire book out in an A4 size. So the sheets were, so I had pages on a big fat folder. Uh, of all the episodes and I've worked through them and, and, and I kind of looked I just look because I mean there's some great material obviously most of them the big material I always thought was, was great but there are some weaker episodes so then I just had to sort of sit there and sometimes I would go oh, man, I don't like that very much oh, I'll that. and Frank would go what happened to that because there was a classic one where there was an episode where something like um, Ravelli run up the curtain and Chico goes, well, what do you think I am, a squirrel? And I go, God, that's sheep. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Frank said, what happened to the, what happened to the squirrel guy? Because I go, I don't know. Put it back in. I don't mind. Yeah, put it back in if you want. Got a huge laugh, didn't it? On the note. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now other times I'm thinking, I'm looking at some stuff and going, that's not very good. I that, that, that. Remember the squirrel. Remember the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> After the squirrel, I was just, you know, holding them, but you know, I mean, there are some guys like you know, I'll give you know, in the doctor episode, there's something like I'll give you, I'll give you cigars, cigars all over your body. And I'm thinking, trying to make cigars sound like scars, there that's awful. You've got secrets from me, cigarettes, it's secret. It's on the end, okay, okay. <laughs> That's true. People think that writers don't want to cut lines, but it's really actors who don't want lines, yeah. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, but 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 you know, but it's one of those things that I wanted to keep as much of the original and so in the first series i was really just sort of bolting things together and then trying to meld them so so you were you were looking for episodes that that had similarities where you could combine them yeah so i i think because you know if you look at them some of the scripts you know they you you, you couldn't sort of have a, a dumont style character every week at uh, the show but you went through the scripts and there they were and I've got my big fat folder still in, in my cupboard there. And it is got, whenever there is, there is like the kind of pages and it will have the line there and a line through and it be used episode three. Yeah. And I'm going to, and, but if you want the, the more of an idea is that Andrew T. Smith, who wrote this book about the original files and then BBC files, it was amazing. He, he went through and listened to me and listened to them and worked out roughly on work. Got the thing I thought, I want Ash, uh, did you do that? Because you know, you must have listened to them back and forth. So if you know, if you want to have a good idea, do try and get a copy of his um book. It's called Marks and Remarks. Because yeah, he really starting to listen to them. And I mean, you know, I mean, as I say, I've got the the kind of, you know, the the unit, the key to all mythologies <laughs> in my uh cupboard there. And I can tell you exactly where they came from and where it went, but not off the top of my head. Presumably when you started out doing this you didn't envisage the the show having a, a sufficiently long life that there would be further series of it and so you were probably much more cavalier with it with the amounts that you were using and then as it went along you were starting to find that that uh you had to be a lot more careful with uh how much you were using 
No, no, really. It was a funny thing because it was Dirk who saw when we got the pilot, it was Dirk who thought that there would be just the, we'd do the one series. And so we got the rights to do um, eight shows. The BBC contract department, Alana Hensler, I think was worked there, got the right to do eight shows. And so we did the the, the first series. But no, I was always, because I thought there were 25 scripts here, because there were 26 in the series, but episode 21 has still never turned up. And it wasn't with the original cash. I thought, I always thought to myself that, you know, I could put that. So I, I looked for some sort of good bits of that. And, but I always thought to myself that I should try and, Although, to be fair, if we were doing six shows and there were 20, there was quite an embarrassment with Richard. And so I didn't really, I didn't want to destroy episodes. I would try and find a strong, a good, strong episode so that I could use all of that episode and then look for st- other stuff that are, I bet was a, it was a weaker episode, if you like, or was a similar thing, had a good start to me, didn't really, whatever. And then I would sort of move in five or six minutes from somewhere else to make up the 24 minutes of, of, of scripted material. So, yeah. So, but, and, but the funny thing is, is that we got a second series and then we had to, then we did, we only had the rights for two more shows. So we, so, that, so that's when the BBC copyright department went and got the rest of the book so that we could then, gee, got the, uh, or the rights to do the, we can use the entire book. Oh. And so, so, but the, but the phone, by the time these rights came through and I did it, that, that, and we had the studio, we got the studio date booked up. I got given actually very little time in the end to do the second series literally just like about five six weeks of doing and uh which is ironically then i then you loads of material uh from and that and but again tried to kind of uh hope well there was some stuff that didn't fit other than but when they then they liked that and they asked me about a third series i said is there enough left for a third series and i thought well not really but I have kind of like have it on to, if you like, I kind of ring fenced four or five good chunks from scripts that I haven't used yet. So I can build a third series on that if you want. That's quite honest about it because they're reading that they wasn't. So yeah. So it's hard to know that, but you know, so you, you don't know these sort of things in advance. They like the pilot. And so obviously they, they, they gave us the chance to do the series, but no, we had no idea what we get it to a, a second or even a third when we're doing the first. So, but I was just, I was just looking for a good, as I said, I will, I wanted to keep as much of the original as possible. And so I would look for a good, a, a good strong episode and then kind of fill it, uh, stuff. With. And again, you know, I have to say, and it's entirely my choice. So <laughs> if you didn't like it, I, was, I mean, it was, it was one of those things, you know, I was suddenly sort of sat there with the books and that, uh, it was my opinion in the end of, it, of what I felt was the strongest of that book. I then got into the BBC when they announced it, so we were going to do this and do that, found that Nat Perring, one of the original authors, was still alive. And uh, they contacted him to set to, to an interview with him about BBC reviving this thing. Which, uh, and then I thought to myself, well, hey, you know, genius that I am, I thought somebody must have his contact details then. So, which, you, which I then got from uh, BBC and contacted him myself. And so, that was, so that he loved the kind of the, the, the shows and the work. So, so if you, any sort of wants to say anything, well, you know, uh, it, it, it was in the end, you know, Nat Perrin approved. He didn't mind, he liked what I did. <laughs> So did you, did you meet him or, or just? Yeah, him? I did in the yeah. end. Yeah. Yeah. I eventually, I, I struck up a correspondence with him. It was old fashioned, uh, steam mail still back in the days. There wasn't, mm. I think, I think faxing had just become a thing. I think I said my first fax, uh, around that time, but no, I, I wrote to him at his home and, uh, he, he replied, he read that dear Mark, it's always nice to hear from my Mark's brothers, but I have been on uh, both personally and professionally since 1930. I thought your tape was just fine, and that's more than I can say for your handwriting. Nope. <laughs> we did all that. He says, if I were you, I would pursue it to the bloody end. So this is a guy that, uh, that but yes, yeah, so other than that, I, I have to say I typed all my subsequent letters to him <laughs> because I would, 
when we do a series, I would get them on cassette and send them all out to him and with another letter and he would always write back in it. So, so yes, yeah, but yes. And then, and eventually, um, the BBC, it, it was quite funny that the BBC were, they were repeating these things. We used to have a thing called, uh, the world service and the show would fill out. The show would be broadcast for which you would already be paid and you would get paid corresponding rates for repeats, current repeats, delayed repeats. And they would always, you know, sliding scale down over, over the size and the world service thing was was minuscule it was a, it was a fraction of what your original tree was but there was some kind of um contractual problem with slow or whatever that it couldn't be broadcast on the world service for some reason so it had to be done on a, something called a transaction or transnational transact i forget the actual word of it but the concept it meant that they had to pay me 100 percent of the fee again for the, for the into the entire series and, and every time I thought wow and when I saw this check I thought I'm going to go to Los Angeles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh, so that was how I was able to go to LA and uh, meet uh, meet Matt Karen went to his home one afternoon just, uh, he was in mid 80s then long retired I answered the door to be you know brown as a berry tan relaxed had been at the Hollywood club that morning playing tennis so, but then, so yeah, and we had a fantastic chat because he'd been a lifelong and his he was married to Helen, who, who her own she was out shopping that day. But she where well, they met and she was formerly the uh, secretary for Burns and Allen in when 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 they met. And it's sort of oh why wasn't she? <laughs> it fits up with well. uh, I mean it was just sat there. Thing, you know, the people that Nat knew and had, and had worked with her, obviously he was a lifelong friend of Ratchets, became his conservator when they had the whole situation with them planning it. So yeah, so um and and he just loved the show. And he was so and he loved the, the idea of putting songs into the in fact that I think at one time I was chatting with John online, I, I completely forgotten. I'm so used to the songs being in the middle of our shows that I completely forgotten that they hadn't done that on the original. And and I asked him that sort of you know, talk me through a day, you know, the on record because they recorded the first ones in New York, but, and then they got tired of traveling back to the boards, and so they recorded. I think Flywheel was one of the first radio shows to come from the West Coast, and uh, and he said they literally recorded in an unusual studio, but they had a fantastic band there, and I think he said they had this singer to sort of open the show. And then Groucho and Chico came out dressed as their uh, that, as their characters. But also he said about the script, he, he, he was right and said that Groucho said that Nat did a better Chico than, than Chico did because obviously Nat would sit in for the read the rings <laughs> like that. <laughs> when Chico wasn't there and he would call him, uh, I think, call him Doc or Professor because Nat would have little pin his hands on his nose. But it was just fantastic to be sat there listening to some guy talk, you know, giving you the run through of a, of a day, you know recording flying yeah. so this was during the run of the shows not afterwards that you got the the now parent seal of approval as it were oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i sent him i sent mm. him the pilot on the tape with a letter and he, yeah he replied quite quickly and then when when the first series was recorded i put all those on to cassette and sent them to him as well i said i sent him and with with uh with a letter for every series and stuff like that and it's going nice Quite a nice little correspondence here. I think I think it sounds I think I've got it digitized now. I'm, I'm certain I've put some of the letters on the on the Facebook site. They are now very nice letters. Yeah, I'm saying, but what was annoying to me at, at that time is, is that it was nineteen ninety one. And so I just didn't have all of the knowledge of the information that I have sort of subsequently now at, at, having grown up with all the books and the because I say this is what you didn't have in the pre-internet generation. So I hadn't read things like um, Hector R.C. It's a great biography of Groucho because I'd never seen a copy of it in England. So I didn't really appreciate fully Gloria's Stuart's sort of role in, uh, in, in their lives. Or, and the Sheik, of course, and that just referred to him as Sheik the whole time. The Sheik died, obviously, in the mid-70s, short before Groucho was so um but it was nice to learn a bit more about uh him as well but i just also asked them 
uh, questions and uh, other things that I was interested in. And as I said, it sort of being a script and stuff around, we've only got certain amounts of time to do it. People come up and say, oh, this, oh yeah, that was, well, that was a great ad lib. And I'll go, that, that wasn't an ad lib. No, that was, that was in the script. <laughs> and, and that would play. So I would say, I was asked to sort of that and he said about sort of the ad libbing and, and, and that said, he said, well, I saw them in Baudville. I saw them on the Broadway stage. I worked with them in radio and film. And he said, but yeah, in, on stage, they would, they would work with the thing until, until they felt that they'd got the optimum, the, you know, uh, routine and then pretty much kept it the way it was. And then he said in radio a bit, so that, but only in the, only in rehearsal, because shows would be broadcast live and we couldn't suddenly ad lib two minutes and then, then, then throws everything out. And he said in film, never. So, you know, it's very interesting. And also there's a lovely, uh, thing else. There's a very famous article that S.J. Perelman wrote about doing a retreat for an early version of Paul Sperry's, or well, it might be Mikey Pixels, but, but he had this one meeting where, where Perelman writes about giving this meeting, this reading to the Marxists and they all come in to the Hollywood Roosevelt hotel where the reading of the script is. And they come in with the wives and their dogs and they sits around and so that. And at the end they have the Perelman does the read through and at the end of the it speaks. They didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's monkey business. And they all walk out. And and that was there. That was in the room. And he said, well, it wasn't a very good script. <laughs> <laughs> he said there wasn't wasn't that much. And he said it just wasn't ready. Like it really did stink. But if you have Groucho in the room, he'll actually <laughs> say so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, w- whenever people uh, ask me about my adaptation on I'll Say She Is, um, and they want to know how much of it I had to write. Um, I always feel a little torn I, uh, between wanting to answer honestly and wanting to take credit for my work, but also wanting to preserve the authenticity of it, you know, like that I had to do a little bit of surgery. I had to fill some gaps, but but it is the original show and don't think of it as something I wrote. I imagine you have had a similar relationship with Flywheel. Um, and I, I would like to ask you the question I prefer not to be asked, <laughs> which is, I, I wonder if you can give some examples of jokes that you had to write or things you had to interpolate and, and capture the spirit of the original script. Yeah, well, it's right. It, it, it's fine because I set out to do that. But yes, now I was very uh, pleased because when we got the third series and I had these bits and these stuff was just about well, why now, you know, I, there was, there was a moment where I literally ran out. So I wrote about two thirds of the third series myself in, in the end, which was very, and then particularly then we got the Milligan and Rosborough characters in the bones. And it was interesting because like, like you, I was saying my sort of, my goal was for people not to be able to notice the scene. Which is sort of quite a dissonant because then you sort of think, well, that's, that's, that's really great, but now nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like the invisible writer. So, yeah, so one in particular, I was always fond of this line that, um, when I was sitting there, when I mean, we did the flyby wheel tours episode, the tour bus episode where they wreck this tour bus, then they wind up in court. And I like that sort of opening scene because you, know, you remember there's a great courtroom scene in Buck Sheep. And it was like, um, we had Dick Boss for that, and he played it sort of perfectly because I had this sort of character called Donald J. Spotlick was the name of it. The voice that they picked for this was lovely. But you could just see this guy, you know, my son, the lawyer, and the plastic bow tie on my, his first day in court, and the poor schmuck comes up against the Marx Brothers, you know? <laughs> Would you please tell the court your name? Uh, uh, Daisy. And your second name? Maisie. And what is your recollection of the crash? (laughs) Hazy. Hazy, Maisie, and Hazy. Objection. Oh, Lord groans. Not only is the defense painting the witness Snow White, she's brought the seven dwarfs with her as well. (laughs) No, I knew that Mike was sort of looking forward to to, uh, to saying this line, because he... Paused. I was up in the building watching this something. He paused before he said it. And I, I bring that thought. You, you waited too long, and the audience are going to guess the gag and not laugh. But, <laughs> but then he was in on it. And there are others like that. Whereas a uh, monologue I wrote for Mike in the Gold Rush 
episode just before he sings uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska. And I mean, that again, terms of my modestly termed adaptations, which I absolutely, I'm saying, I don't care. I thought, where was he when we needed him? <laughs> I was never, I was, uh, how was, yeah, how was, I had many, 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 many years to wait to be born. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is the, it is the lot of the most brothers writer, isn't it? To be, uh, yeah. to be an invisible person. Yeah. I always think it's a shame. Like, it's like, if we could have ever have done a, a Harpo episode. <laughs> yeah. because it's 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 radio and you can you know it's just sound effects gags you just have to have you just have to work it out a way of you know and, and chico would or somebody would be saying that you would have the fx gag or something and then you know chico would be doing a line that, or hunt would be doing a line so that you could visualize what harpo had just done rather as opposed to naturally being able but but we just didn't get and up and it would have taken me, it would have taken me too much time, but I would have blocked it. I got, I, I, I worked out something, you know, I, I blocked some things in my head in the end that I was unable to use or I ran out of time or we didn't get that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't see why Harpo could work in radio. Not all the time. But. <laughs> you know, about 12 years ago, I think there was a stage musical. It was seen in the New York Musical Theater Festival, I think in 2010 or 2011. Um, that was adapted from several of the original Flywheel scripts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was called uh, The Most Ridiculous Thing You Ever Hoyed. Um, <laughs> and uh, at least one of the uh, authors, uh, Fred Wemmis, is a, a member of the council on Facebook. I think maybe one of the others, right. too. Anyway, with this show, what they, they incorporated Harpo into it by making him the Foley sound effects guy yeah. in, in the radio studio. Um, and, you know, but of course they had the advantage of being a stage show and being able to do visual things with Harpo. Um, but that was an interesting way to, to try to get him involved. But I was blinded because I wanted to sort of bring him in as a character and you could bring him in silent sand, see, and then there he is. <laughs> he's a, he's a character, not, not the spotted base guy, but a character in his own right that, you know, just doesn't speak. I wanted to ask you a bit about the songs. You mentioned the songs earlier because having once decided to include uh, some 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 songs, as the shows get along, go along, it gets more and more inventive. So, for instance, you have a uh, chick singing the monkey doodle do, I think, don't you? Um, and also some 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 non Mark songs that are that are yeah Mark's yeah. in flavour. Who was that? Your idea? Who? who, who? Well, uh, basically, I think yeah, you know, the some of the songs obviously the were the obvious ones that just suggested themselves. You know, the songs from the movies. I don't know what you have to say It makes no difference anyway Whatever it is, I'm against it No matter what it is or who commenced it I'm against it uh, Really, except that obviously we didn't have the romantic lead So unfortunately we couldn't do three blind gloves And we're out whatever <laughs> we want, you know, Damn it you know. Um, so yeah, we did the obvious ones And then we go, but obviously we had Frank there it was big musical both all frank mike you know, they were big musicals followed me so i i let that you know if they if they had sort of um preferences or things they wanted to do fine and i should add, i should add actually that i met a lot of people or, or when i met people like glenn mitchell who's the author of the marks brothers encyclopedia amongst many other things and a guy called mike Poynton, who was doing documentaries about the gin show at the time and Others, they and so I asked um, Glenn and Glenn, and Glenn put a little cassette together, of, which is where "Life Is So Peculiar" came from. Uh. The, with purpose, it's come from Mister Dynamite. You know, it is though. So um, yeah, and Frank's suggestion was Gorgon's Zolo. I'd never heard of it. Three cheers for the green, white, and blue. It's one of my absolute favourites. Mm. Uh, and so, so yeah, and then I think um, the real masterstroke was uh, my brother makes the noises for the talkies. Yeah, exactly. I. I think that was Frank again, and also Frank and Ron King can do. Frank could play the piano and do all the do all the tricks, chick out, shoot the keys, play with the orange and stuff like that. And he would do it. Just you know, you know, as I say, we'd have a few hundred people in the audience at the Paris studio to play along. When when he's doing the monkey doodle do, he's sitting at the piano playing. You know, yeah. Yeah. The presence of that very enthusiastic live audience is one of the things that makes. The BBC Flywheel is so much fun to listen to, and and I've sort of come to feel that the whole business of recreating the Marx Brothers, it, it sort of only makes sense with a live audience because 
that's what we don't have mm. with the real Marx Brothers. We have almost no examples of them acting as a team with an audience yeah. responding to them. And um, forgive my uh, American ignorance on this point, but how normal is that for a BBC radio comedy? Was the live audience a big part of the concept that had to be fought for? It depends. We had sort of two two things. So this is the weird thing. I be radio. Flyer went out on Radio Four, but it probably should have been. I thought it would be a Radio Two show because we had these things. You know, Radio Two was was, was kind of like a kind of variety uh, show. Things so I had that a show called The News Headlines of the comedian called Roy Fudd, The Impressionists, with everything like that. And then, um, like here, and you'd go back with the Goon Show and stuff like that. They were recorded. Yeah, in front of live audiences, usually the Paris studios, uh, which are the studios they moved to during the war, the Nagel Arc and all sorts of classic. But I think that that, well, that came because, again, most of the people, like you said, the, they started to use uh, audiences, as I understand it, very early in America, in Golden Age of or America, because, because they, you know, most of the performers and they came from all from the stage and, and they couldn't, work without an audience they needed they needed an audience to, to time their gag time time their laughs and so but we also had a sort of thing at the, at the bbc so yeah I'll, sometimes the radio shows would be recorded in theaters and, and to, to, to get that like uh, audience there but then all of you sort of have a other thing on bbc radio four more likely where we we would record a show I like called weekend and another topical show without an audience, and you would do that in drama and other certain sort of um, you know the Agatha Christie adaptations and all this kind of stuff would be recorded without an audience. I just feel that it, it was just something that was uh, quite natural uh, to me because it had been going on since, and I, and I think you know the, the, the difference here is is that once. TV uh, came in in the States, it, it was the death knell for commercial radio, you know, almost immediately. And we went over to being a, uh, a, a live, uh, you know, talk, the talk radio thing that you, the hand downs, and there was, I think it went into the sort of the 50s. And, but with the BBC, some, it, it, it just carried on going. You know, it just uh, carried on doing um, live audience radio shows. I mean, well, to the state, however, it's a lot less of it. And you get more gang shows and stuff like that. Tell me a bit about the the feedback you got from um, from after the first series from listeners. I don't know. <laughs> That's the weird thing because when I is, is I knew maybe two or two or three other people. It's again the difference thing here is I was a huge sort of Mark Brothers fan, and I maybe only knew two or three other people growing up with a huge Mark. There was was more partner here and stuff like that. And people like you know, Frank Ferranti and others of my age and that sort of generation grew up knowing a lot more about the Marx Brothers. So you couldn't necessarily expect, I mean, even half the people I asked on the BBC Line Entertainment Department had never seen a Marx Brothers movie. They'd heard of them, they didn't okay. know them. They weren't aren't going to go out and see them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I went out there, an American comedy troupe from the, you know, the finished making movies in the 40s and then. We never really got any of that sort of post film careers. Uh, they had Chico and Harpo to a few times, but Groucho's show, You Bet Your Life, came very briefly to English TV. So, so yeah, so no, and I mean, no, I mean, I don't know because I was never shown one. I know I thought Monkhouse was a fan and he did that. That's what I was getting at. It would it would be interesting to know of of the people that liked it and, and became regular listeners. How many of them were just hearing it as a as a comedy show in its own right, and how many of them were there because they were Marx Brothers fans? It would be interesting to know. I only guess I ran into people mostly many many years after the war because if anybody wrote an anecdote that I I was never shown a single piece of correspondence from the general public. But no, I mean I don't know. And I, I don't know, it's very interesting. I don't even know if you might want to drop your illusions about certain things, about the audience response, because the audience response you hear, well, they isn't actually, the, the audience response was fantastic and was much better than that. And for some reason, that's all canned. Oh. Because I've got cassettes of the, of the recordings. I've got the recordings of the recordings, not, not the edited show. It's quite bizarre, and I didn't realize it until years afterwards myself because I never, I obviously never listened to it when it was going out. But well, one time I was listening. If you listen, if you go back and listen to the 
the, the gag I just told you about, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It's just huge. It's got this massive laugh. And, and I was listening to it when I was digitizing them many, many years later. And I suddenly thought, oh, I love this bar. I'm going I'm to stand here and adore this moment all over again. And then suddenly you there's, ah, 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 ah. And so yeah. I always, always broke my neck. And I turned <laughs> and I thought, where's my laugh gone? <laughs> yeah. so, so this is what I think, because there are things, and this is then in the end, didn't like about the produced, uh, but if people love it, then, then, you know, I don't really want to sort of, Disabuse them, but it's an, it's an interesting thing to me. So I think so. Now I can't stop hearing this. I must I must not have actually heard them when they were being broadcast because I I didn't really need to. Ever. So yeah. yeah, maybe you'll have to listen again. But I hope it doesn't. Uh, but, but as I say, I'm assuming that that because what I always hear, what I really hear, is the quality. You know, a of the material, the the original material, because that is the bedrock that it's that it's built on. The wonderful performances, not just of Mike and Frank, but every but everybody else. I mean, and the thing is, is that all of them, I mean, only sort of Vincent and Lorelai, who weren't as bigger, they weren't like big as bigger film boxes uh, as everybody else. So they didn't really have the kind of depth and the knowledge that Graham Lillard would might ask about what should I do with this character. And I mean, I was standing, Vince never heard of non Indian Indian episode. Well, they had the Gold Rush episode, right? He sings, well, I'm calling you, I'll be calling you. Vincent had never heard it. Yeah. He, did, he, he didn't know. I, I literally had to teach it to him phonetically on the day. Why not call him? <laughs> so, yeah, there was some, but Graham and the others, they just, Graham just used Herman Bing for the, for the landlord. Yeah. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't specify Herman Bing type at cat would be good here. And the same with Spike Milligan and Pete Bosbury when they came in, they, you know, they they'd heard these things themselves growing up. Listening to them, to them, it was the chance to work with the Marx Brothers and and to be on some sort of radio thing with a spot effects there and look up to you know up to the mic with their scripts in their hands. I wanted to ask you about Milligan because before uh, coming on the show as a guest, he was a very vocal fan of yeah. of, of the show. I remember him uh, as a guest on on the Jonathan Ross show, and he was asked what. What is your favorite comedy of today? And he said, "Oh, no question. It's it's the old <laughs> it's, it's Flywheel on Radio yeah. Four." So, I mean, how, t- tell us about how he came to actually be involved. Yeah, well, that was funny. He did that because, I, ironically enough, that's I was in LA meeting Nat when he went on the job. So I didn't actually see that. I only heard about it afterwards when I came home. And he said, "Oh, yeah." Now this is the great thing. This is where we got lucky because I mentioned this guy Mike Point, and he was a great researcher and documentary. So it's a great. Sadly, no longer with us. He died a couple of years back now. But, but he was a Greek jazz uh, musician as well. And he worked with George Malley and done documentaries about Betsy Smith. And he happened to be doing a documentary about the Goon Show at some for Radio 4 at the time. And he was going down to interview uh, Spike Milligan for it, obviously. Now, coincidentally, is that Dirk was also producing that for the BBC as well. So, so obviously... Dirk went down to, to record the interview with Mike. And obviously, Spike was there and he said, you know, sort of expressed a desire. I don't have exact, or they expressed a desire to work with the Marx Brothers before he died. So obviously, he was going to, you know, I'm sure we can, I'm sure we can work something out, Spike, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah. So he came and then, uh, and then we pulled in Dick Bosborough as well because then Spike was there. That's showing in like eighty nine. He thought, and, and he thought we'd be nice to sort. Of, they they knew each other a bit, and this is where it brings in another weird story for me. It's because years before I and, and literally before I even started writing, I was working in a, a bookshop at that point. In, uh, and as I say, in the pre-internet days of the VHS, you know, you'd go to see WC Fields movies or the Mark Brothers on, on the big screen. The Everyman Cinema in Hampstead ran a after the end of WC Fields pictures, so which I went to see, you know, but, and there, just a few rows ahead of me, was Spike Milligan and Dick Mosbrook watching these movies themselves because you know you didn't you know, unless unless you had access to the BFI or something you could do. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't say anything to her; I was too shy. Or, uh, but I met Dick a few years later, working on another show about a comedy show, and then for the first time, and then got Spike in, and I. And, I'm, and I reminded him, I met him, I 
movies. And, and Spike immediately said, well, that's what you had to do. If you wanted to see those movies at yeah, back in time in those days, you had to go now, if you're lucky enough to be able to get to a cinema that ran them. And this, you know, this was pre-VHS, you know. So it was great to then be there like about seven, eight years later, they're there. And uh, the other thing is because we recorded the shows at the Paris studios, which is where they had recorded the games. And apart from an appearance in the last, in a, in a documentary about uh, when they closed the Paris studio down, that was Spike's last appearance yeah. at Paris studio. So it was quite something. There you are, Mr. Flywheel. That's Crichton Mansion. That house has been haunted since Mrs. Crichton's grandfather took his own life. Along with that of his wife and five of his children. Hey, who did he kill first, himself or his wife? <laughs> Was it his idea to do it in a, in a field's voice? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I didn't. It's you know, such they, a wonderfully they, perverse idea oh, to yeah. go on the Marx Brothers show and, and do a WC Fields impression. Well, it, it's the thing, but the, the, the great thing is, is, that, is that Mike Robertson was tells it. The, the, the story is great. It's also is that Mike did an ad lib. And Spike came in on it. He crushed it a little bit on that. And then he said afterwards, he said, "Oh, I'm sorry, that's it. I, I, I crushed your Milton Berle." He said because <laughs> because it wasn't an outlet. Mike had pulled a line of an out, out of an old Milton Berle movie. Spike had recognised it. Kind of came in. He said, "I'm sorry, I, I ruined your Milton Berle." You know. So, that. so um, but yeah, no, that was like. It. But also. When he played the ghost as well, you know, I, I because I wanted to, uh, 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 you know, get a ghostly laugh, so I typed out, ha, 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 ha. and he just went, ha, 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 and read, read every ha. I just like, you know, yeah, ghostly laugh. I could have written ghostly laugh, but no, yeah, yeah. Was he on good form then? Because I've, one of my kind of long term projects is a is a a, a a book about his his work, and I've interviewed dozens of people that work with him, and. They all said the same story, which is, you know, you never know what you're going to get until the day. Some days yeah. he's, he's, you can't shut him up. Other days he just, you know, crumples in on himself yeah. and, you, and you get nothing. What did you get? Yeah, well, we got great because we, he really only it turned out we got a couple of, um, we had a couple of read groups and, um, and he loved scripts and he was chatting with Nick Rosberg. So I think we got a pretty good, uh, Spike because because he was working with the Mark he was doing something he, he really wanted to do yeah you know, he was a little bit spikier yeah, a couple of times but he's very very sort of long in a way sort of long suffering uh, something because he was at this sort of point in his career he literally sort of told me he sort of said that you know they, they didn't want him to do anything anymore they wouldn't commission mm. him to do anything but they yeah. but they wanted him to come to these sort of awards things these celebrations of and stuff like that and uh and he said, you know, they were coming out, they'd pick him up in the car, take him down. The minute it was, I was like, okay, fuck off. Nah. Nah. <laughs> that was, that was his phrase. But, but um, yeah, no, I mean, he was, he, he liked doing that, but he wasn't, we were there, he got down sort of mid afternoon, we did every record in the evening. The whole thing was like five or six hours. And uh, for us, it was just great to, you know, we would have a read through of the script. And then have any notes or any ideas or any thoughts from anybody, and then we'd have another read through of the script, incorporating anything that had come up in the first read through. And then, if we were lucky, we could get a full run through with the band uh, before the evening recording. Mark, I wonder if there were ever any retakes. Did anything ever have to be redone? Was it all perfect the first time out? It was. It was pretty good most of the time because that's the idea of sort of having the read throughs and the run throughs stuff, and then almost any. But almost any live radio show, if it's not actually being broadcast live, that means one these are being just re re uh, recorded. Yeah, there was always, if you weren't sure about something. But the only time I remember shows really stopping is that after he sung Omaha, Nebraska, they just did that. Omaha, Nebraska, and what is it that? The staple came out of his script and it just fell in a cascade. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the next, he's got, he's got the next line through the last line. So I was like, so I thought, oh, all right. So I did, I grabbed my script and I ran down and handed in my copy of the script so we could carry on doing the show. It was the one disaster. But, but no, yeah, but there were always little things, things to retake, maybe on a, from a technical point of view or they didn't know. You would just ask, they would have asked and said, well, can we, can we just do that line then? Can just give us a clear, you know, yeah, but not much. Sometimes on a Marx Brothers project, you, there's a small part of you that wants something to go wrong. 
because it's <laughs> it's in the spirit of things. And if your Marx Brothers are really in character, it, it can be a lot of fun to deal with problems as they come up. Yeah. Come to think of it, uh, the entire series, um, which, by the way, is available on Audible right now, if any listeners are wanting to get their hands on it, in the United States anyway, the best way seems to be through uh, the Audible audiobook uh, app. Um, but it's it altogether, the series is about eight hours long, which I think makes Mike and Frank the most, I mean, I don't think there's anyone else you can find doing eight hours of Groucho and Chico <laughs> other than Groucho and Chico. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, it's 18 shows and they're so, yeah, they're about, yeah, you know, about that. Yeah. So, as you said, it's the same with, 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 with the CD that we couldn't have done like they do with them. Um, they with albums, you know, we could have had outtakes or something like that. Yeah, altern- alternate takes, you know, and stuff, but they, they, as you said, they are available. They, they go out, they're available now on CD, finally. Um, they go out on BBC Radio 4 Extra fairly regularly. And the iMag nine newspaper, the independent newspaper, it picked up on them, and and they said that after about like I mean twenty odd years ago that we recorded them, how you know they got good nice sort of review again because they people thought they could just listen to them again and again, and they were still enjoying them. Mm. I do highly recommend them. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this particular uh, edition of the podcast is because. I I wouldn't want anyone to think that this was a kind of a stopgap venture uh, when we thought the originals didn't exist. And now that we know a lot of these originals (laughs) are coming, that it's kind of obsolete. Uh, It isn't. It is a really nice little bit of Marxiana in its own right. And I know from the Facebook group, an awful lot of people who said, you know, that was that was my gateway to them. Uh, there are also an awful lot of people who say I still listen to them regularly, uh, and I know people who who actually enjoy them more than 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 the movies. Um, so so I think you know I, re- I really do want to make make a claim for them as as eminently worth listening to in their own right. If anyone out there uh, hasn't, I, I recommend them wholeheartedly. And me too. <laughs> <laughs> those royalty checks don't come from nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean it was uh, it, it was great. It, it was it was one of those things. It was fantastic to go to, to to do it. But yeah, no, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's weird because because if then the book had come out, some of that, and then it's, oh, there were no, no, and John had been there, and he goes, no, wait a minute, I've got I've got loads of them on this. <laughs> oh, okay, we won't do it then. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, Mark, thanks ever so much for being our, our guest today. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I will be asking you to select our final song in a moment. But first, uh, Noah, do you have a word from our sponsors? Yes, I do, Matthew. Um, the big news in Patreon land right now is that we have just introduced a fifth subscription tier. Uh, we had some uh, reasonable requests from subscribers for a level somewhere between Students of Huxley, $6 a month, and Left-Handed Moths, $20 a month. So, we are pleased to unveil Huxley Students. Students of Huxley and Huxley Students. I guess that covers everything. That won't be confusing. (laughs) $10 a month, and the rewards are access to the Patreon page and its exclusive content, including the monthly bonus segment, uh, the original postcard delivered to your actual physical mailbox every month and a beautiful sticker modeled on the kippered herring barrel design from monkey business don't be caught singing sweet adeline without it meanwhile as we record this postcard number seven is at the printer and as you listen to this it's in the mail and on its way to students of huxley huxley students (laughs) left-handed moths and fireflies (laughs) cabinet um, but after two great guest postcard artists in a row, we had Jim Engel and then Tristan Yance. Uh, this next one is mine, but on the plus side, it has no connection to Skidoo. And uh, <laughs> once again, any uh, artistically inclined listeners who might be interested in contributing a postcard design, please get in touch and uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. And finally, as always, and most important, Thank you to all of our Patreon members and all of our listeners who are considering becoming Patreon members and uh, all of our listeners who would never consider becoming Patreon members. We thank you, too. And once again, thank you very much, Mark Brisenden, for agreeing to be with us for this edition of the podcast. Have you had a thought to uh, what our final song should be? 
Yeah, I mean, it was so it was a really, really tough choice. But in the end, I went for um, Doctor Hackett emotion because when we there was this sort of episode, it's like Matt Perrin was talking about in I think in the original um, essay in the book of the script, sort of some of the bad we were reaching for our other ideas, and so you know we we switched around the titles on the doors and then one week he was a doctor so so obviously we used dr hack the books you know which is why you know because i mean why isn't it in a day at the races you know i mean you know they would just send it over the top i mean you know so really kind of then like, here he is he's playing a doctor and he sings dr hack the bush in the in, in the series we got you know we, that that felt like right you know <laughs> we put them together correcting you know. historical injustice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay dr hack the bush it is Thank you very much. If that's the case, I'll go. Oh, no, you mustn't go. Who said I mustn't go? The only reason that I came is so that I can go. I'm Dr. Hackenbush. My medical standing's very high. Well, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Hackenbush. He's Dr. Hackenbush. I'm Dr. Hackenbush. As a matter of fact, to be exact, I'm Dr. Hackenbush. I'm sure we all would like to hear some facts about your great career. Although my horn I hate to blow, there's one thing that you ought to know. I'm Dr. Hackenbush, which all my friends will verify. Well, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Hackenbush. He's Dr. Hackenbush. I'm Dr. Hackenbush. You never would guess, but nevertheless, I'm Dr. Hackenbush. <laughs> for ailments abdominal, my charge is phenomenal. Though I'm great for, I'm a rate for tonsillectomy. Sick and healthy, poor and wealthy, come direct to me. Oh, God bless you, they yell. But they never, no, they never send a check to me. I won a claim for curing ills, both in the north and south. You'll find my name is like my pills in everybody's mouth. I've never lost a case. He's never lost a case. I've lost a lot of patients, but I've never lost a case. <laughs> my diagnosis never fails. I know just what to do. Whenever anybody ails, I'm sympathetic too. My heart within me melts. His heart within him melts. No matter what I treat him for, they die from something else. <laughs> When your nerves start to rock, put your faith in your doc. When you're sick, he will stick to the end. With a possible exception of your father, a doctor's a man's best friend. Yes, a doctor's a man's best friend. A doctor's a man's best friend. Whoa, a doctor's a man's best friend. A doctor is a doctor is a man. But you don't have anybody over here. Day, day and night, on his call you can always depend. With the possible exception of your mother and your father and your sister and your brother, your nephews and your nieces and your uncles and your cousins, whom you know are my cousins. A doctor's a man's best Brothers Council podcast is produced by Bob Gassell. Matthew Cunningham's books, The Annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me Groucho, are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, is published by Bear Manor Media. For more info on this and all episodes, visit our website at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. See you next time.